Donnie and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business, we can help. It is Friday, and all of our guests today, including Thomas Drantz, standing by. Sponsored by Passant Motors. Purchase a vehicle at Passant Motors this month, and they pay your GST, that nasty GST, Rick. Also, oh. also, did you know you can get a car with zero down payment? Get all the details at PassantMotors.com. Good guys, Passant. Canucks losing 5-2 in Calgary. They host Seattle on Saturday. Uh, they host San Jose on Monday. You've got some Canuck news uh, regarding uh, Linus Carlson. Oh, uh, yeah, our good pal there, uh, Jeff Patterson, just uh, tweeted that uh, uh, Carlson's going down to the minors. Uh, back down. Back down. And uh, look at this. Uh, it all means, like I, I just said last segment, Kuzmenko's 100%, nothing broken, all's good. Well, this Donnie. isn't about you. Ah, okay. just stop. Look at this. Uh, Hiroshi's back up. Carlson back down. Kuzmenko ready. That's it's unbelievable, given the visual uh, we saw against the Islanders Whoa. regarding Kuzmenko as we bring in Thomas Drantz uh, from The Athletic. Thanks for doing this. How are you, sir? Gentlemen, thank you for having me. I'm doing well. Yeah. Wow. Looking good in the cardigan. Um, Thomas, uh, <laughs> they lose 5-2 to the <laughs> – I don't know why I Thanks, said that. Bud. Yeah. <laughs> How heavy is that? How heavy is that? It's it's You know, it's, it's the perfect cardigan for a sunny November day. And yeah. as they say, never take a sunny November day in Vancouver for granted, gentlemen. I won't. No, no coat today. Just a heavy cardigan or a somewhat heavy cardigan. L I don't look, know. Looking it's good. Nice anyway. Take the compliment. <laughs> uh, last night's game, uh, and, and the Flames are coming off a road trip as well. But for the Canucks, five games in eight days, the uh, Eastern uh, yeah. road trip, uh, multiple time zones. Does that one fall in the excusable category, Thomas? I mean, it does for sure. Like. You know, this team doesn't lose frequently enough for us to get up in arms or have our hair on fire. For those of us who have hair, anyway, yeah, right. uh, over a, over a loss on a back to back, um, you know, on the road to a Calgary Flames team. But Donnie, what I what I'd say is it's not not going to get easier, right? That was what five and eight, yeah. well six and ten yeah. on Saturday against uh, the Seattle Kraken, right? Seven and twelve uh, by the time they faced the. Um, San Jose Sharks on Monday, you know, then they're flying to Denver, different time zone again, and that'll be, what, 8 and 12? Then then they've got another back-to-back -back on the road right after that. So, you know, this is a moment where, and I saw some conversations about it on Twitter yesterday where people were like, look at how soft the Canucks schedule is here. And, you know, there's nothing soft about playing this many games yeah, um, in this condensed a fashion, right? Um, the Canucks are going to be pressed here. They're not going to be 100%. We, we, we've got some injuries building up, and this is what happens over the course of a long season. It's why, you know, I, I tend to wait and see. I, I want to see a team play 30 games before I decide mm -hmm. if I think they're a contender, what I think their ceiling is. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it wasn't a great performance for the Canucks, even with the built-in excuse of being tired. And I do think there's some stuff we're seeing from this team, you know, crop up that that i think is still a little bit troubling in terms of for example their ability to control play with their top six forward group on the ice like as 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 much as this team has scored they've been outshot five on five with miller and petterson on the ice this year um hmm. you know it, over 15 games you can survive that especially with how talented uh various parts of this roster are but over 82 if you if you're gonna you know have your sights set on like vegas and la for the division crown you know, you need to be controlling play. You need to be consistently generating a territorial advantage when you've got your best centerman on the ice. The Canucks haven't done that on balance all season, but especially the last five, six games, like since that win over Edmonton, I think you've seen some more inconsistency creep into their five-on-five -five game. And don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that this team with a power play that looks like an atom bomb, right, and Thatcher Demko didn't play last night, uh, looking like a Vesna candidate doesn't have a ton of outs to still be a, a good team despite this. But I, I do think, you know, some of the softness we're seeing in their ability to control play five on five could hold them back from being a team that sustains this level, right? This like division uh, contender level over the course of 82, unless it's improved on. 
All right, uh, let's get uh, over to Kuzmenko, Thomas. Uh, you know what? He, that, that was scary. I, I, yeah, was. Ro- he was rolling around. Everyone's kind of like, oh, my goodness, this guy's got a broken jaw. Maybe, you know, everything. It looks like they, they came out of that relatively, uh, you know, unscathed. It looks like he's going to play. They've uh, sent Carlson down. Uh, but how important is it? Uh, you know, that's not a long-term injury. That's great news for them. That's big. I mean, they need Kuzmenko in the lineup, and they need him to be playing like he did last year. Last year, I, I, you know, I know the I know the points have been there, and there have been moments like I thought that game in Ottawa was was pretty good for him, despite it being sort of a um, not the team's best game. I liked his physical assertiveness in that game. We saw what he can do in terms of breaking open a close contest against the Florida Panthers in Sunrise. But I feel like the games where we've seen Kuzmenko be the difference maker, right? Like uh, the straw yeah. that stirs the drink for this team offensively have been pretty few and far between this season. Um, you know, it's been quiet for him uh, five on five, frankly. It's been quiet for that line, you know, and, and when we know petterson has been playing through something, we know Mikheyev's just back from injury. And, and you know, I, I don't know that Kuzmenko has been driving for them. So, you, you know, I, I'm a little bit concerned again about the top line and sort of where they're at in terms of that ability to consistently generate a territorial edge. I, I think Kuzmenko's struggles sort of fit into that. That said, when he first took that shot up high, you know, I immediately thought of, do you remember Dan Boyle hit Dan Hamhus high oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, on yeah. Rogers Arena ice like six years ago? And I'll always remember Hamhus talking about that moment and saying, you know, he he rolled his tongue along the roof of his mouth and found that it was soft. Right. And and that's always stuck with me as just a huge concern that I have whenever I see a guy get struck by a puck moving at that speed up high. You just worry that they're sp- going to be spending, you know, two and a half months with a wired jaw drinking out of a straw, unable to play NHL games for a bit and then wearing a visor uh, or, or a full mask when they return, which for Kuzmenko, who makes his living in the blue paint. Right. That's that's tough. I'm glad to see really, really glad to see that he's avoided that injury. Okay, what are you hearing about Pedersen? A uh, lot of talk about the contract. Yep. Uh, we're hearing short-term possibly. Uh, but the, I think the key, uh, Thomas, is they're talking. And you know, and, and the fact that they're at the negotiating table trying to get the, both sides, want to get it done, that's, that's huge. Yeah, get it done. I mean, at this, like, honestly, having bridged Pedersen, right? Like, I, I was pretty critical of the team when they went short on Pedersen the last time out. But if you go short on him on a second contract, I don't have nearly as much of a problem with it. Uh, There's a few reasons for that. One is if you're going max term, you know, you're paying the maximum cap hit, right? You're going to pay more money. And you've got this window with Quinn Hughes playing like the best skater on the planet at seven and a half or just over seven and a half. You've got Thatcher Demko, um, you know, channeling prime Dominic Hasek more nights than not making five. Um, You know, that's a two or three year window here. Uh, you've got the OEL buyout, which is going to expand. You've got Heronic to do. You've got JT Miller's age to factor in, right? The fact that he's at $8 million and uh, this is, you know, statistically speaking, the li- likely the best value that he'll represent on this current contract. Um, you know, you, you have to be mindful of, of taking a shot with this group, I think. And I don't know that this team has the luxury of taking, like, an open-ended shot with this group i I think you know some of the short-term moves that this club has made have narrowed the path pretty significantly and and short-term savings on petterson's next deal i think matter so if it's if the interests align for petterson to sign you know a three or four year deal that takes him through the bulk of his 20s um but gives you even a million million and a half in savings over what you'd be be forking over on an eight-year deal I don't really have a significant problem with that, given how this team is positioned, even if, you know, this club won't benefit from the sort of long term cost certainty, which can really help from a team building perspective if they take that route. Um, Fact is, is that getting Pedersen's next deal done was probably the most important single piece of work facing this management team in the 2023 calendar year. The fact that there's positive momentum, the fact that there seems to be a, a greater willingness to engage now as opposed to at the end of the season. Um, the positive buzz that I'm hearing in the industry, yeah, that's all great news for the Vancouver Canucks. Did you know Philip Hronik was capable of unloading a shot the way he did the other night? Yeah, like the, shot, the shot is, I mean, his shot has always been there. We haven't seen it much because yeah. he doesn't play PP1. And, you know, people don't take as many slap shots these days. Like, have you noticed Quinn Hughes, right? Quinn Hughes with the drag shot. 
He added like an Austin Matthews style drag shot. He watched Bedard highlights all summer or something. Um, but that's how Quinn Hughes is scoring. And the advantage of that, Donnie, is in the in the contemporary game, like there's, you know, time and space is so much of the game now, right? So there's a few things we don't see anymore. We don't see shot blockers leave their feet. Have you noticed that? Like no one sells out to block a shot mm -hmm. unless there's like five seconds left in the game because the amount of time it takes to recover can, can kill your chances of transitioning. Uh, we don't see players load up for slap shots very often. You know, Ryan Pulock of the of the New York Islanders, who we saw play at Rogers Arena this week, uh, you know, he's like one of the few guys who still regularly takes slap shots five on five. Fact is, is that the shot takes too long to load up, yep. right? It's too easy to defend. Uh, the way that players block shots now, the way that defensive, uh, like even wingers uh, are so attentive to, to defensive zone play, like it's just too hard to get that shot off. So if you're not playing on the power play with that extra space and right. time, if you're not taking those one-timers from up high, you know, it, it, there's just not a lot of slap shots going around, um, which is too bad because you can see what what sort of damage, yeah. what sort of velocity Heronic can get on it. You know, what was amazing too is like, I don't know that that was a full windup. It certainly, he certainly didn't step into it. This wasn't like was. Sammy Sallow, yeah. you know, cruising in from two steps behind the blue line to hammer home a Sedin pass. Um, you know, it, it was pretty casual. Like it, it, he, he was pretty ca he pretty casually got a hundred miles per hour on the radar gun. And I want to note too, like I love that there that the shot was originally clocked at like yeah. eight miles per hour faster than <laughs> yeah. it was. Yes, yeah. and, and not 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 making fun of anybody. I just love that there's like the legend of Philip Peronic that's like growing and it's becoming like a tall tale. Right. There's like increasing levels of unbelievability. It's like you know his eyes contained the fires of hell. And his beard was as smooth as a Persian rug, you know, and his his arms were thick as tree trunks. And he once shot a shot 108 miles per hour. The legend of Philip Peronic. Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying that part of it, too. Yeah. Although that only lasted 12 hours. Uh, the song was <laughs> the song was Love Fool uh, released in August of 96. I'm sure you remember it. The name of the band, a Swedish band, the Cardigans. Oh. Mm. You might, we'll want find, to, uh, might want to check that out, uh, Thomas. I will. I, you know, I remember the band, actually, from, like, Rick D's Top 40, but oh, I, uh, oh, I can't Rick think of D's. the song off the oh. top of my head. <laughs> hey, I thought I, I thought I was, you know, coming up with a great poll with the Cardigans. Rick D's. Rick D's. Excellent. Thanks for this, Thomas. Appreciate Cheers, it. Cheers, boys.